Eloisa. Eloisa, I have to. Uh, uh, what is the word? I uh, I have confession to make. Uh, I, for the last 32 years, have been a Russian spy in America, learning American customs and American phrases and American accents. It re it's a really nice summer. We should go down the ocean, hon. It's so nice down the ocean this time of year. Oh, did you see that far? Did you see that far? The fence caught far last night, and I had to put it out. I've been studying the American accent for many years, many years. Like I said, I started when I was five years old in America, in Baltimore City. In Baltimore, there was more murder than in Russia. They murdered people so frequently in Baltimore. You look at a person funny, they murdered them. Baltimore City was a rough place. It was a rough existence growing up as a child spy from Russia. Trying to learn how to be American. Be American. Oh, I am American. Oh, I love myself. I love myself. I am American. I expect privacy in the public area because I am American. I expect privacy within 10 feet of my body. Everywhere I am, America. Now that I fall in love with you, Eloisa, this much is real, that I fall in love with you. Now that I fall in love with you, my cover is blown. I can no longer be a successful Russian spy. I am going to have to move to Milan and become your lover in real life, Eloisa. You have ruined my life's work. I'm I'm not from Russia. I I've always loved Russian accents. When I uh, won a period in the nine and a half years that I spent with my wife, we were separated. I was in Gettysburg because I worked in Gettysburg as an ad guy, advertising salesman, and the front desk guy for the overnights. His name was Dimitri. Dimitri, the front desk manager at the Gettysburg whatever the hell hotel it was. I do not recall. He told me a story of when he come to America. He went to a, 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 a Dimitri, he did. He went to a, a popular uh, American restaurant and he asked for a bottle of vodka because you wanted to feel like home. And they said, we cannot give you the bottle of vodka. He said, well, I will drink the bottle of vodka. And they said, no, we have to give it to you in shots. This is America. Dimitri had just arrived in America. And so he was flush with cash. Flush with cash. He did not come to America a poor man. He came to America with enough money to survive for a long time. And he had a job lined up, he was not worried. And he was celebrating coming to America. America, the land of the free, where you cannot get a bottle of vodka at a restaurant. What is this? So he tells the waitress. Not only am I and my two friends going to drink a bottle of vodka. I want you to go get a tray. And if you can only give this to us in shots, I want you to put 100 shots on that tray. If you need two trays, you bring two. If you need three trays, you bring three. But you bring me 100 shots to this table right now. If you cannot bring me a bottle of water, bring me 100 shots. Dimitri... He pays for the 100 shots and tips the waitress. And he and his two friends, they drink the 100 shots of vodka. That is how Dimitri came to America. Dimitri was a good man. He was a young man. He could drink 33 shots. I just don't, I don't know. I think he was probably embellishing the number of shots. But yeah, that's what he did.
<laughs> the waitress was like, I can't give you the bottle. And he asked for an absurd number of shots. That It led more than a bottle's worth of shots. Well over a bottle's worth of shots. Dimitri. He was pleasant as hell. When somebody keeps you uh, in, like, out of communication from everyone else, like, almost everyone else, like, when somebody has you, like, on communication lockdown because it's a controlling relationship, when you do connect with people, you connect real hard. Dimitri, yeah, he was one of those people. Well, you see, that's the thing. That, that's why I was so controlled. Because this this person, who I love, I, you know, I love her. Uh, you know, you don't stop loving somebody just because they treat you terribly. And maybe you should. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing, and I don't purport to. But uh, this woman, who, who I love, uh, uh, you know, she she loved me so much and was uh, so terrified of, 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 you know, losing me as a uh, possession that she kept me from talking to anyone she you know like she was fearful of the facility which with I with which I, I connect with other people and the shame of it is that it's not like that People connect with me because I make myself vulnerable. That is the basis of a human connection, is mutual, mutual vulnerability, you know. Um, but it's, you know, I make myself so vulnerable, as you can see, all of this, that no, nobody can really match up to that, <laughs> you know. Like, nobody else is willing to put themselves so just full frontal out there emotionally and so I don't get the reciprocation I don't get the connection I you know strangers connect with me immediately when I meet them people connect with me over periods of time when I step into other people's social circles the connection does not last and it's not felt on my side not as not anywhere to the degree that you people tell me that you're connected with me. Since I was a child, that's what it's been. So... 10% chance of, uh, this is my understanding, the statistics, which, of course, every time you talk statistics when it comes to health, you have to bring up the Mark Twain or Oscar Wilde quote, I don't remember which, and I don't care, Google it, or criticize me in comments, I don't care. But when you bring up statistics, you have to bring up that quote, that there are lies, and then there are damned lies, and then are statistics. You can't really base things on statistics necessarily, but they do help us understand risk. And uh, the, you know, particular uh, type of malady. Again, half a lifetime ago, I was diagnosed with like, having features of BPD. Uh, but, you know, the criteria, I, uh, there have been mo most of my life I've fit you know, seven or nine of the criteria. So it's like, I, I just kind of own the fact that that's where I need to look as far as where to dig out of mental illness. You know, I'm pretty sure I'm a borderline. I really fit the, you know, other borderlines identify with how I am because I put myself out there. So I'm figuring that's where we're at. There's plenty of other things, of course. There's an eating disorder. We've discussed this. But, you know, the... Borderlines are always cross-contaminated with other things. Uh, I'm losing my train of thought entirely. The whole point of the intermission was to rest, right? Uh, that's not happening, was it? I even needed so much rest, I decided to make the intermission. <laughs> and I'm going to go ahead and reveal it to you now, because I know people are getting annoyed. 
by seeing it. But I told Alan, the guy who's uh, doing art on a comic book that's in development. You know what? This is a secret, okay? This is a secret. Don't tell anybody. But there's a comic book in development. And it stars a certain person that's starring in a certain film that he couldn't get any help on. So he had to be his own film crew and director and writer and producer and gaffer. And what are the other terms? I'll Google it later for the credits when we've put together the sequel to the first film I already released. And I'm setting up screenings for Daniel Bullard. Thank you for helping me, by the way, with setting up screenings. Wow, what a personal time we're having here. This is nice. There are people walking down the street wondering why I'm talking to devices. No, they're not wondering. It's 2016. People talk to devices all the time. Five points. I get to gaze into Eloisa's eyes in still images, because that is all I've seen. I like to think that sometimes she gazes into mine. Because it's strange to know someone so well and not have met them for the first month and a half that I talked to Eloisa I did not look at her face I knew I could I'm not dumb I'm a professional social media user I was until the Ides of March now I'm an entrepreneur I could have seen her face at any time. It's not hard to find somebody on the internet. But she was talking to me every day and I didn't need to look at her. Because she was showing me who she was with her expression, with her words, her language. She was showing me who she was with how interested she was in who I was. We showed each other who we were. Or... We were two people with unfixed personalities immersing in each other and taking from each other the personalities that we had gathered. It's like Pokemon. You gotta catch them all. That's how we are at Borderlands. We meet people and we take the best of them, take it with us, and then we use the best of them to try to impress the best of you know, the people we can find and take the best of those people and use it to impress the better people you know, as though there's some hierarchy of value. We all end up in the dust of this planet, yes. I have been robbing you of a Santa. gonna go to uh, Applebee's today because they sent me a gift card again thank you Applebee's for sending me a gift card I need to eat I know I need to eat Ugh. I'll go ahead and rehash that because some people don't know why I talk about Applebee's today on lunch they're not a sponsor 
except for the fact that they sent me a gift card to because they were like, Joel, you need to eat. I mean, they, it wasn't like that. Like, they, yeah, Applebee's is not as aware of my eating issues as, you know, a handful of the people in my life who have been encouraging me to eat more. Uh, however, you know, I do talk with Applebee's on Twitter. I have since I started my feed. They were my first follower. I am up to, I don't know, 1,500 maybe-ish people following me now, but they were the first ones, and it was just me and them at the start. I know, they follow everybody. It's not a big deal to get Applebee's to follow you. All you have to do is, like, you know, glance, give them a come-hither look, and they follow you on Twitter. But Applebee's marketing team is clever as hell, and they're responsive as hell. And, like, they're willing to joke on, like, a pretty edgy level. I've been impressed with Applebee's marketing team. I've been wanting to join them. Hey, I'm out of work right now, guys. but not on the telephone because I don't have one of those. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, Applebee's has been good to me, is my point. Uh, there's a man inside who is a medically giant man named Tom Hand. He's a very funny man, very quick comedian, Tom. He uh, produces a show. Along, he, along with some other handsome gentlemen, produce a show called Homegrown Comedy. And, uh, you know, it's a showcase of Southern talent here in Huntsville, Alabama. It's a good show. It's a great show. They get good attendance. Great comedy show. Comedians, be jealous. The, 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 yeah, Homegrown Comedy. They were in the Flying Monkey Theater for a while, and I got to be on the last show that they had there. And uh, during that show, I thanked Applebee's for being my friend. I, I talked to people about the fact that, like, Applebee's... <laughs> Uh, the sound was terrible uh, in the recording, so it's like that clip I barely ever show people. But I, I, uh, I tell, I tell everybody the exchange that I had with Applebee's that like solidified our friendship. Okay, uh, Applebee's and I had been talking. Like I said, their first follower and all of that. They're feeding me now. That's how close we are. But hey, yeah. Uh, I, you know, like I had been talking with them and stuff because they're a clever marketing team. And one day I was just feeling wistful because I have a personality disorder. I'm always wistful. And I said to Applebee's uh, on Twitter, I was like, hey guys, you know, I know that this is a fake friendship, but it really means a lot to me. And I, I meant it sincerely. And they've been very cautious and careful with my personality disorder, and they've been very good to me. They tweeted back to me within seconds, Applebee's did. They said, no, Joel, this friendship is real. Exclamation points everywhere. Applebee's is so sweet to me. Applebee's is more supportive than most of my friends. And I can say that with absolute because, no, I do have a core group of friends that are very extremely supportive and way more than Applebee's. Not being that hyperbolic. But out of the 50, 60 people that I know performing in this scene, Applebee's is more supportive than, like, uh, I'm not going to name a number. Because I don't want to be too condescending. Oh, too late. All right. Sounds like something broke in the garage. I'm going to go in there and check. Uh, let's see what it is. I'm, I'm cleaning the garage up in exchange for... Writing supplies, pens, paper, you know, crafts. You know, they tried to put me on electroshock therapy when I was getting um, treatment. Electroshock. All right, I got to clean up in here.